Hello and welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar, uh, The Role of Audiometry in a Hearing Conservation Program. Uh, my name is Jans Babkovich and I'm an occupational hygienist uh, with a special interest in all things uh, workplace hearing conservation. Uh, as always, I'm happy to see such great attendance and it's good to see familiar names and faces joining us today. So uh, the, the webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes and the plan is to leave about 20 minutes uh, at the end for the Q&A. So that is the plan. So fingers crossed, we'll have two speakers today. Uh, and since uh, I'm already talking, I will briefly introduce myself. Uh, so on the right, you have your host and speaker, Jans Babkovich. Uh, I'm a practicing occupational hygienist uh, based in Huddersfield, England. Um, I work for a, an agrochemical manufacturing company called Syngenta. Uh, I'm responsible for the site with more than 400 employees. And uh, I successfully managed the site hearing conservation program for the past two years. So in, in my part of, of this presentation, uh, I will briefly speak about key elements of a successful hearing conservation program and how they all come together with the ultimate goal to protect workers' hearing. I will examine requirements of each element, including audiometry, and highlight how they all should work together uh, to be effective. Uh, the main speaker uh, we will have today is Professor Ted Benema. And uh, I'm very excited to have him at this event. Uh, so Ted is an audiologist with a very rich career in academia and clinical practice. He holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy and master's and PhD in audiology. Uh, he was a clinical audiologist at the Canadian Hearing Society in Toronto early in his career, uh, and more recently at NextGen Hearing in Victoria, BC. Uh, so between those years, he was with Uniturn, a hearing aid manufacturer, where he conducted uh, field trials on new hearing and uh, hearing aid products and gave many presentations domestically and abroad. Uh, Ted has taught in the hearing aid practitioner program at four different colleges, and he is the author of textbook Compression for Clinicians. Um, Currently, he's working at Douglas College in BC, Canada, teaching the Hearing Instrument Practitioner Program. So in his part of this presentation, uh, Ted will talk about the causes resulting in the audiogram unique to noise-induced hearing loss. He'll describe the general physiological damage that occurs with noise-induced hearing loss. Uh, and we'll talk about principles of noise measurements and ear protection. If you're interested in audiology and hearing protection, I highly recommend checking Ted's educational videos on YouTube. Uh, that's actually how I discovered Ted's work and his unique presenting style uh, immediately resonated with me. Uh, that's why I'm pleased to have him presenting for the society and helping to spread awareness about hearing, uh, about hearing loss. So without further ado, let's get into it. So, first thing first, um, what is a hearing conservation program? Well, it is a program of collective measures, both technical and administrative, aimed at preventing occupational hearing loss. It is certainly not just taking some noise measurements, issuing hearing protection, and sticking on a few warning signs. In fact, it has multiple elements where each element plays an integral role. I someone took control over my slides. Try to take it back. Okay. So back to this slide. So here in conservation program has multiple elements uh, where each element plays an integral role and various disciplines participate in delivering such a program, uh, including occupational hygienists, audiologists, occupational health nurses, engineers, 
managers, and of course, employees. In essence, the hearing conservation program is a never-ending project. It's a never-ending project. Um, Lee, can you make sure no one takes control over my slides? Because when someone joins, it looks like they're taking control of my slides and I lose my presenter notes. That'd be great. Oh, uh, apologies. No, I've got no control over that. Yeah, if you just be careful as to, to what people are clicking, please, and uh, make sure you don't um, click any of the options while the presentation's going on. Um, have you got them back now? Though? If someone wants to co-host, please feel welcomed uh, after my presentation. But uh, let's proceed with this one. Um, so, in essence, the Hearing Conservation Program is a never-ending project uh, that goes through repeat cycles of reassessment and continuous improvement that may last for several, several years. So when administering a hearing conservation program, uh, you should remember that you are in for a long game and that patience is your best friend. Uh, but nevertheless, the reward is great. It is the ability to preserve hearing and stay connected with the world. A truly comprehensive hearing conservation program uh, will have seven key elements. Uh, these are exposure monitoring, hearing protection, employee training program, uh, excuse me, employee training, uh, program evaluation, uh, record keeping, noise controls, and of course, audiometry. Each of these elements is integral to a successful program and none of them should be neglected. Uh, I had the pleasure of working for several years uh, for an occupational hygiene consultancy where I visited various workplaces to carry out noise assessments. My experience suggests that unfortunately, too much emphasis is placed on exposure monitoring and hearing protection with noise controls and program evaluation being uh, most neglected. Uh, so to ensure we understand the role of each element, uh, let's dive in and explore them in greater detail. Exposure monitoring is arguably one of the most recognized elements of a hearing conservation program. Uh, when you think of occupational Voice protection, an image of a sound level meter inevitably comes up. When a workplace identifies the need to protect people's hearing, it is most likely that noise measurements will be taken to answer the question, how loud is the workplace? And of course, this is the right thing to do. However, the most important thing is what you are actually planning to do with the noise exposure data that you've obtained. When exposure monitoring is conducted, we are generally aiming to collect sufficient data to answer the following questions. So first question is, are personal daily exposure levels below the exposure limit value? Um, so, so that um, we know what, what people are at risk. Uh, second question that we want to answer is um, which areas have background noise levels above the upper exposure limit value, that is 85 decibels in the UK, so that mandatory hearing protection zones can be designated? And finally, third question that we want to answer is um, do personal daily exposure levels routinely exceed the upper exposure limit value? which is also 85 decibels in the UK, so that a formal program of administrative and engineering controls has to be established. Uh, so these are three questions. We want to know if we do not expose people above um, legal exposure limit, so that is 87 decibels, taking into account the attenuation provided by hearing protection. Uh, we want to know which areas have high background voice levels, so areas exceeding 85 decibels, so we can designate them, designate them as hearing protection zones. And uh, we need to know if 
people daily exposure levels routinely exceed uh, 85 decibels, eight hour time weighted average, because uh, in the control of noise support regulations in the UK, it is actually a, a legal duty to implement a program of engineering controls when such limit is exceeded. Once you have collected uh, exposure monitoring data, uh, we can decide if the use of hearing protection devices is required. Um, in the UK, uh, personal exposure shall not exceed 87 decibels when accounted for uh, the hearing protection uh, device attenuation. If the need for hearing protection is identified, um, we, we must ensure that it is adequate, uh, that it is sufficient, and that it fits the user. So for it to be adequate, it has to fit the task. So for example, uh, in an environment where hands are always dirty, uh, using roll down earplugs uh, may lead to an ear infection. Or in a hot workplace, issuing earmuffs uh, may lead to excessive sweating and discomfort, resulting in poor hearing protection device acceptance. For hearing protection device to be sufficient, uh, we need to make sure that it is capable of providing sufficient attenuation for the noise levels encountered on site. This is done by examining the, uh, the declared uh, noise attenuation values uh, and comparing them to recorded exposure levels uh, using accepted uh, methods such as uh, SNR rating, uh, noise reduction rating. HML methods or octave bound methods. Uh, in essence, what these methods do is um, you have your uh, exposure levels on site and um, you want to go with one type of hearing protection. What you, in essence, do is subtract uh, hearing protection of device from the highest noise level on site to see if when you subtract it, then you have. Uh, noise levels that not exceeding that the, the exposure limit, uh, but there is more to that because noise can be of different characteristics. Uh, it have um, different spectrum. It can be high pitch noise, low pitch noise. So methods vary in their complexity. For example, SNR rating is a very simple method, single number rating. It just subtract uh, noise level values, uh, attenuation values from noise level values. HML method is a bit uh, more sophisticated. You take into account high, medium, and low frequencies. And uh, octave band method is the most uh, the most uh, comprehensive method where you account for each uh, octave band and make sure that uh, people's hearing is protected uh, in in each frequency. Um, finally. No two ear canals are the same, and uh, it has to be recognized. Um, similarly to face fit testing, uh, when using RPE, uh, HPD testing is recommended to ensure that all users can fit the device correctly and achieve the estimated tension values. Um, this is interesting one because it's not a legal requirement, and it is a relatively new thing with. Um, hearing protection testing. Um, health and safety profession at the moment is at the point where it's it's widely, well, it's it's recognized that no two faces are the same. Uh, but for some reason, uh, there's still assumption that two ear canals are the same. Uh, but in fact, it's not. It can vary a lot by the length, by the curvature, uh, by the diameter of, of uh, ear canal. Um, so having that, uh, fit testing, hearing protection, um, makes sure that the, the earplug, for example, that we supply actually fits it. So it's not only confirmation that attenuation values can be achieved, but it's also a training exercise um, to make sure people know how to correctly insert them. Um, so this is something I recommend, uh, but just to make sure, uh, make clear, it's not it's not a legal requirement at least in the UK. Um, what I want to summarize about 
hearing protection is that it, it, it's important to understand that the use of hearing protection is only one element of a wider program and it's not your final destination. Uh, the preference uh, should always be given to higher levels of controls and we should uh, aim to eliminate or reduce the noise exposure at source. And this takes us to, to the next element, which is noise controls um, in the UK, uh, in the UK legislation, uh, when personal daily exposure levels routinely exceed 85 decibels, eight hour time weighted average, it is a legal requirement uh, to implement a formal program of organizational and technical measures, excluding the provision of personal hearing protection. Uh, this means uh, we cannot solely rely on hearing protection devices when our workplace has a noise problem. Um, noise controls can be engineering controls uh, or it can be administrative or a combination of both. Um, so anything related to rotating the workforce to minimize exposure time uh, would fall under administrative controls. Uh, while installing some hardware uh, to reduce noise exposure at source, uh, at transmission path or at receiver uh, will be classified as, as engineering controls. Um, so some examples would be using noise exposure calculators to see how much time each person can spend at uh, doing uh, a specific noisy task before it exceeds limit, and arranging people's um, work schedules in the way that they, they don't exceed the exposure limit. So just allocating tasks that everyone receives uh, equal exposure below the exposure value. Uh, th this is an example of administrative controls. And engineering controls, it can be acoustic enclosures, silencers, um, coatings, uh, vibration dumping, um, all that good stuff. Um, what I want to uh, highlight is that uh, when you implement engineering controls, uh, we need to recognize where our competency ends, uh, competency of occupational hygienist, and where the help of an acoustic specialist is required. Um, in my opinion, uh, the competency of an average hygienist or health and safety practitioner is unlikely to be sufficient to design cost-efficient and effective engineering controls. It is easy to spend a lot of money on ineffective solutions, uh, so I highly recommend uh, reaching out to acoustic specialist companies uh, when you feel that their help is required. And um, again, based on my consultancy experience um, and from what I um, from from what I read from um, UK HEC is that um, there is there is a there is a lack of advice that is coming from hygienists on uh, noise controls. So when noise exposure assessment is carried out somewhere, uh, what people what clients usually get in their report is good exposure estimates. Uh, uh, you can get good noise maps, identify high risk sources, uh, high high noise sources, but you don't get that. Uh, competent advice on noise exposure. And um, you need to be careful if you want to increase the quality of your reports and provide such advice, uh, because you, you do want to point out what correct steps need to be taken, uh, but you don't want to specify what exactly is needed because you don't have that degree of competency of uh, an acoustic specialist. Uh, so what I, what I suggest to do is uh, to point out the right direction and where the help is needed. Uh, so I would usually specify how noise can be controlled. Uh, I can specify that it can control, be controlled at source, at transmission path, at receiver. Give some common example. For example, UK HSC website published top 10 noise solution. So I can refer to that. Uh, and then I would always say where you can get a, a proper help of uh, acoustician and why it needs to be sought. Um, so in summary, the key role of this element is to reduce personal exposure levels 
uh, by addressing the most problematic uh, noise areas. So next element, training. And um, training is important um, because you can have the best engineering and administrative controls in place. You can have, you can, can select the best hearing protection devices. Uh, you can fit people, uh, you can do fit testing and make sure um, the devices fit the wearer. Um, but if people do not appreciate the risk of um, noise induced hearing loss, uh, control measures may be neglected. Uh, through the training, we can influence the perception of the noise hazard and subsequently workers' behavior to ensure that it resonates with uh, noise exposed employees. Uh, we need to make uh, we need to pay attention to three aspects when we when we deliver training on noise hazard. Uh, so first is it has to demonstrate uh, what noise induced hearing loss really means. Uh, hearing loss is invisible and there is a perception that it is somehow a, a lesser disability. We should design our training material uh, to communicate how in reality, how disabling, frustrating and life changing condition it is in, in reality. There is an excellent audio file um, from the UK HSE that uh, simulates what uh, progressive noise induced uh, hearing loss sounds like, uh, which I would definitely recommend using in your training. Um, so what it does is um, it plays a, it, it, it plays conversation. So you sort of listen to someone having uh, someone having a conversation and first there is no no noise induced hearing loss and you can hear it perfectly fine uh, then they apply 10 decibels of uh, noise induced hearing loss then 20 decibels and i believe up to 40 or 60 decibels where it's profound um, hearing loss and you can just see that how frustrating it is because it's not only that you um, lose volume you can't hear them it's just that the entire speech becomes incoherent because you lose uh, hearing loss um, primarily in four kilohertz uh, region, uh, this is where um, vowels come from. So uh, you just your, your your brain misses crucial sounds and it cannot translate uh, words. You know, it cannot make sense of words speaking. So you hear someone speaking. They don't need to raise voice. It's just that you don't understand what they what what they're telling you, and and interestingly, with um, with noise induced hearing loss, uh, the society has very little patience for this disability. You know, people don't get uh, irritated with uh, with someone who who is blind, for example, but when someone with someone who uh, has poor hearing and constantly um, asking to repeat yourself. People uh, lose patience very quickly, so it is frustrating to have it, and people need to understand how disabling it is. Excuse me. So um, they have uh, motivation uh, to take all actions necessary to preserve hearing. Um, second element of training uh, that we need to uh, pay attention to is that the training should be give clear and simple instruction on what steps can be taken to prevent hearing loss. Uh, this is the information uh, on how to use engineering controls that we provided. So if it's acoustic enclosures, how to make sure, you know, to make sure it's fully closed, no gaps left, all that good stuff. Um, should be information on where hearing protection devices can be located uh, so they can be used. So location of um, ear, earplug dispensers or where earmuffs can be issued, um, as well as how to report any deterioration in exposure control or early signs of noise induced hearing loss. And third element, uh, we should touch on legal duties, and it's actually a legal, a legal requirement to include legal duties in your training. Uh, but we need to be careful. We don't want to provide too much in legal information uh, because we are at risk of uh, 
uh, boring people and they will just switch off. Uh, pe people need just the right amount of uh, legal information to understand uh, what they can expect from the employer. And um, they need to understand their duty towards the employer as well. Uh, but most importantly, any training, <clears throat> excuse me, any training should be specific to the site where people are exposed to noise. Um, generic noise training packages uh, are okay, uh, but the main goal we are striving for is to resonate with the workforce. If we invest some time and money into a bespoke training package, um, it will be much easier to achieve and the training will resonate with people and will influence behaviors and uh, the result will be positive. Let me just take a sip of water. And let's move to this uh, element, which is evaluation, program evaluation. And uh, it is a crucial element in any hearing conservation program uh, because It's, it's not enough to implement several exposure controls and hope they will result in a desirable outcome. We have to make sure that we achieve that desirable outcome. Um, it would be a waste of time and resources to continue investing in a hearing conservation program that has little effect. Uh, evaluation helps us to avoid that. The program can be evaluated through repeated exposure assessments following the implementation of engineering controls to ensure noise levels have been reduced. Um, the program can be evaluated through a hearing protection device uh, audit. Uh, apologies, skip the slide. It can be evaluated through a hearing protection device audit to confirm hearing protection is uh, widely used across the site. Uh, so that is when we uh, do like a walk through surveys um, because we want to know, you know, we can do, we can find out what people are exposed to. We can select the right hearing protection. We can do all the calculations and confirm that when it's fit correctly, people do receive that attenuation. But again, again, we need to make sure that it's, that it's actually working and people are wearing that hearing protection. So it can be walked through a survey just to see if people are using them, it is fit correctly, uh, or it can be auditing stop levels, see what is the consumption for earplugs, uh, how many earmuffs are there on the plant, and to see if it corresponds to approximate predicted level of consumption. So we can do that. And um, of course, the best evaluation of the hearing conservation program to understand if it's actually working is to examine the results of audio, uh, audio o audiometry to understand if there is any negative trend in um, people's hearing. So I'm glad that in the most in the updated um, guidance, uh, approved code of practice to noise at work regulations, it is now explicitly stated that um, audiometry provider needs to anonymize, uh, needs to provide grouped anonymized data to the employer so that uh, it, it can be evaluated if, uh, if there is a negative trend in uh, noise induced hearing. Loss. So we have uh, listeners of all ages here. It's good to know you need to learn about noise induced hearing loss from uh, from early age. I wish they uh, taught this in school because it's a uh, very important information. Right on to the next slide. Uh, briefly about this one, um, record keeping. Um, it's another element that is important to a successful hearing conservation program. Um, maintaining good records uh, helps to address any future compensation claims. Uh, it generates the audit trail and it allows us to document our path uh, to legal compliance. Um, demonstration of legal compliance may, may prove difficult in the absence of uh, well-kept records. 
Um, what I think is the, the of course, you know, having um, good documents to uh, to provide when there's any claims into noise induced hearing loss is, is a good thing to have. Um, but for me, this element is important because the ability to demonstrate your continuous improvement process. If you remember when I started, I said that hearing conservation program is, is really a never ending project. You kind of never uh, reach your destination. You might be where you like to be, but it's not a final destination. Uh, and when there is any sort of audit, internal, external, auditor, or just uh, any type of examination, what has been done to address address noise problem, you need to have the documentation that is able to show, you know, five years, let's say 10 years ago, there was that these noise levels in these areas, you know, two years later, we, we you know, we, a year later, we contracted acoustics company and they came up with these solutions. Two years later, we worked with engineering department and we implemented these solutions. Here is a noise exposure reassessment three years after initial survey and it demonstrates reduced noise levels. And then here is a, here is a trend in noise induced hearing loss uh, for our site. And you can see that it, you know, it flatlined. There was no noise induced hearing loss five years after uh, we, we've done initial survey. So being able to tell that story through good record keeping is what the most important uh, in my opinion. And finally, uh, the last element and uh, the reason why we all gather here today, uh, which is audiometry. Uh, with the help of exposure monitoring data, uh, we can identify employees at a significant risk of noise induced hearing loss uh, to enroll them in audiometry. So what is a significant risk? Well, uh, according to the UK HSC, uh, workers who are routinely exposed to noise, in, uh, to noise uh, levels above 85 decibels daily are deemed to be at significant risk. However, some people may be at risk at uh, lower levels if there are additional risk factors. And um, additional risk factors um, can be something that is a core exposure on site. So a good example is core exposure to autotoxic chemicals. Uh, so for example, uh, exposure to both toluene, well, exposure to noise um, and toluene have a synergistic effect, which means that um, if you would be exposed, um, if you're exposed to noise, uh, toluene, exposure to toluene exacerbates it. Uh, but some substances can uh, result in um, noise induced hearing loss, well, in hearing loss without noise, without exposure to noise. So even being exposed to autotoxic auto chemicals alone without exposure to noise uh, can, can warrant signing someone up for audiometry because we can, there can be damage in hearing just through exposure to autotoxic chemicals. So you always need to be mindful of that. You know, what else is there? Um, a part of uh, noise out there. Um, and of course, medical conditions. Uh, you can have pre existing conditions. Um, well, I know that uh, there, there, there is a practice to um, sign up people for audiometry uh, if they have uh, pre existing uh, hearing loss, uh, which makes them uh, vulnerable. Uh, but I don't really support that idea. I don't think the pre existing. Um, hearing loss makes you vulnerable to noise induced hearing loss but what it makes it what it makes you is that you have less to lose which means that whatever you got left it's much more valuable and maybe that's why it warrants to uh, to sign you up for noise uh, for uh, audiometry uh, but other medical conditions such as uh, if you take uh, some autotoxic medicine uh, some antibiotics or if there is some um, neurological uh, conditions uh, that I cannot uh, comment on. 
So I don't know, um, but they do exist. Uh, you would work with your occupational health provider to find out uh, what medical conditions um, make people uh, vulnerable, susceptible to noise. Um. Audiometry is essential uh, because it aims to prevent a significant noise induced hearing loss through early detection. Uh, this early detection uh, allows us to trigger a formal risk assessment review process uh, for the area where the noise exposed employee works to understand if additional control measures are required. Um, as such, uh, audiometry is, is a leading, um, it is a lag, or just it's a lagging gauge that indicates if our hearing, if our hearing conservation program is, is working as intended. Um, and this is very important and I want to pay some attention to it. Um, when, when you picked up uh, a sign, when your, audio, when your audiometry picks up a sign of noise induced hearing loss, it's not, it, it's not that the, on, the person who suffers from it needs to know and then refer to GP or OC physician. Um, that, that information needs to be communicated back to the health and safety department to an occupational hygienist as a feedback saying that, look, I know we have these hearing conservation program, but people are still losing hearing. You know, that person works in that area. Can you um, reevaluate your risk, redo re your risk assessment to find out if we fail somewhere? Because people do lose hearing and I believe it's noise induced. So please check if there's anything additional that can be done. And this is very important. Uh, if, if that medical information is concealed from health and safety uh, professional uh, under the veil of confidentiality, then it has no use uh, in helping other people to prevent uh, noise induced hearing loss because we cannot act on it. So it is very, very important to to work with your occupational health provider or occupational health department to establish that communication. Uh, you know, they, they, they need to know, uh, what you, you need to know the outcome of, of audiometry because it will inform what you'll be doing. And for you, it will be that uh, ultimate confirmation that yes, our hearing conservation, we, we figured it out correctly and our hearing conservation program is, is working as we intended. Um, so to summarize audiometry, it is a powerful tool uh, that when used correctly, uh, can be your guide on your journey to hearing conservation. Uh, it is important to understand that there, are, there is a close connection between occupational health and occupational hygiene. Um, the information between both disciplines should be free flowing and the work of an occupational hygienist should feed into the work of an occupational health physician and vice versa. Uh, so when we do our exposure assessment as hygienists, uh, we obtain those daily exposure levels and uh, we need to understand occupational health provider or physician needs that information to inform uh, his work, uh, his or her work because if it's a bad practice to sign everything up for, uh, for health surveillance, uh, so it needs to be an informed decision. So what we would do, a, what we can do is to create a health surveillance risk matrix, for example. Uh, we say, you know, this area, these job titles, and these people are exposed above 85 decibels. So whoever works in this role needs to be signed up for audiometry. Uh, we can say these people are exposed to 80 to 85 decibels. So if they're susceptible, please sign them up as well. And then we can say there are people exposed to autotoxic chemicals. So even though they're not working in noisy areas, please sign them up as well for audiometry because they are at risk of noise induced uh, in hearing loss, not noise induced hearing loss. Um, so we need to provide that information so they can do their job. And in return, they provide us anonymized information. So it's not more, no more 
the medical confidentiality does not apply. If it just says that uh, pipe, fe uh, pipe feeders on plant A um, have a trend of noise-induced hearing loss over the past uh, two years, then we know that we need to act, we need to look in the area and to repeat our risk assessment. Right, so this concludes uh, my presentation, and I hope you are now equipped with a broad understanding of the requirements for a successful hearing conservation program. Um, Lee, would you be able to advise if we have Ted online? Perfect. Thank you all for attending, and I'll talk a little bit so you can get uh, acclimatized to my Canadian accent. Um, just be glad that I'm not talking, I guess, in a southern uh, USA, Alabama accent. Because, <laughs> But anyway, uh, thank you very much for having me. And um, I am hailing, talking to you from the middle of Saskatchewan, Canada, which is a, a long distance away from the UK. I understand you've had some heat wave there. It's been hotter than Hades, I hear, in London anyhow. But uh, here we go. My purpose today, I am not really completely familiar with BOHS, but was kindly invited by Jans to speak, and I'm delighted to do so. My topic, of course, is noise-induced hearing loss, but it's not really from from a, a, a what do you call it a familiarity with how things are handled by BOHC in the UK I'm rather going to be talking to you about the nature of noise induced hearing loss and what it really is let's get a take a look inside the ear with what happens with noise induced hearing loss because it's quite a trip I mean noise induced hearing loss is the second most common cause of hearing loss in the world it's also the most preventable. The thing about noise induced loss is it is preventable. Aging hearing loss, hearing loss due to aging is called presbycusis. If you've heard of Presbyterian, that would mean Church of the Elders, presbyopia, your arms aren't long enough to see the page, so you get reading glasses, hit you when you're 40, and presbycusis, high-pitched hearing loss, an inability to hear the treble sounds is occurring when you're 65 plus, so you can't hear the, the letters S, F, T, H, G these types of sounds. Well, guess what? Noise-induced hearing loss is a very similar thing. Have a look at this picture. You'll see the X's and O's. Everything is normal from the low pitches of 125 to 250. 125 is low C on a piano. 250 is middle C. 500 would be the octave of high C. And leaving the range of music is at 1,000. And now you're getting to double that octave, higher pitches and higher and so on. And it's around 2,000 to 8,000 that a lot of the sounds of speech, namely the consonants, are, are, are audible. The letters S, F, T, H, and all those things. And that is why people with high-pitched hearing loss say that they can hear, they can't, just can't distinguish what you said. And look at the X's and O's here and the drop that takes place just past 2,000. And then look at the recuperation again as it rises again at 8,000. Now, why is that? And we'll look at that too. But again, noise induced hearing loss is the second most common hearing loss in the world and also the most preventable. It's the thing. And looking at where the damage occurs in the ear, it's the inner ear or cochlea. Cochlea being the Greek word for snail shell. The cochlea is about as big as the tip of your little finger, about as big as your pinky fingernail. It's about the size of a Canadian dime. Well, you don't have those, but at any way, you know what I mean, small. About the size of the eardrum, if you look to the left on this picture, okay? And inside each cochlea are 15,000 tiny little hair cells which become damaged due to noise. This would be a picture of those hair cells. What you're doing is going inside that snail-shaped organ and you can see the blue fuzzy hair cells these would be inner hair cells sending all information to the brain regarding sound. Without them, you're deaf as a post. 
The outer hair cells do something different. They take information from the brain and they help the inner hair cells pick up sounds below 50 decibels. OK, that's the thing about the outer hair cells is they they take info from the brain, inner hair cells send info to the brain. They hear the ear is a two way street. If you're looking at the top of someone's skull and you took out the brains, OK, you'd end up finding the cochlea and balance organs buried inside. Look what it says here. The inner ear or cochlea is embedded in the hardest bone of the body. The petrous portion, I guess in Greek, Petra, Peter, the rock, the hardest bone of the body surrounds these entire flowery areas here. OK, and the areas most lateral or toward the out toward the outside are the balance organs, the semicircular canals and deeper in is the cochlea. They share the same fluids and they both have hair cells, but rest assured they're not so much a presence as they are an absence. They are a hole dug into the hardest bone of the body. And it's really, I'm going to stop presenting for just a second there so we can really get that. The cochlea is like an auger shaped hole dug into the petrous bone buried in the skull, filled with fluid and hair cells that way. It's uh, quite something. If you're looking now, we'll move into this uh, picture here showing you how that would be. Look at the try excising this. Look down at your left here. You can see these saw blades that would try to get into that petrous bone and you can see the cube that you one would remove. Take that over to the right and you can see where the cochlea and semicircular balance organs are located. This is a cross section of the cochlea. I've, I've just surround all I've done is sliced it right down the middle. And the gray area is the bone, the petrous bone surrounding the, the coil shaped labyrinth. The orange is the tunnels filled with fluid, cerebral spinal fluid and going into the top, the bottom orange and the top orange share some type of fluid, sp cerebral spinal fluid and what's in the triangles is the opposite fluid. That's going to create an electrical charge much like a battery does. If you're looking at the cochlea unrolled, the hair cells would be embedded in this scala media, this orange area here. And the scala media notice that it's narrower at the wide end of the cochlea and it's wider at the narrow end of the cochlea. That has a big part to say in what what frequencies are stimulated here? If something has less mass and is very stiff, it will be excited by high pitches. If something is very floppy and has a lot of mass, it will be excited by low pitches. If you're sitting down in your apartment and the neighbors upstairs are blasting away the music, what comes through your ceiling is the, the drum beat and the, and the bass guitar. That's because the ceiling has mass. Well, at the left here, the scale of media hair cell region has more mass and it's therefore excited by lower pitches, much like keys on a piano. Here's the hair cells looking from the top. The inner hair cells on the right and the outer hair cells like horseshoes or V's on the left. Another picture of inner hair cells and outer hair cells. It is the outer hair cells that are damaged mostly with aging, presbycusis, and with noise induced hearing loss. The outer hair cells. A picture of normal outer hair cells and a picture of the damaged outer hair cells. Notice that when the hairs are gone, the test tube cell beneath is also destroyed. So here you're looking at an inner hair cell, the type that sends info to the brain, and an outer hair cell, the type that takes info from the brain. Now these aren't hairs like on your head. They are not protein filaments. These are completely a different situation, but they calling them hairs because they look a bit like hairs, but the waves of fluid motion in the cochlea determine what you hear. <clears throat> Excuse me, and as I had said earlier, the high pitches are represented when the hair cells are activated near the wide base 
of the cochlea. Mid frequencies in the middle and low frequencies would be caused by or hearing low frequencies is caused by excitation of <clears throat> excuse me, low, uh, low frequency hair cells near the point of the cochlea, the apex. The apex would be this area I'm circling and the base of the cochlea would be this area I'm circling here. This stirrup bone is the last bone of the middle ear that is pushing the fluid back and forth, and this is what's called the round window. So when the stirrup or stapes bone pushes inward, the oval wind, the round window bulges outward. There's an exchange of fluid bending around the point in order for the cochlea to make its action. And then you'll have a ripple effect along with the hair cell region. Here's the hair cell region blown up for you. You can see the inner hair cells in green circles here, and you can see the outer hair cells as the white V-shaped things. And notice that the base, the wide base of the cochlea has the narrowest hair cell region. The narrow apex of the cochlea has the widest hair cell region. It goes exactly back asswards to the way you'd think. That's, I guess, the point I'm trying to raise. And here's another point. Look at the ripple here. In this particular example, the person's hearing low pitches because the big ripple wave is occurring here. You see, if the ripple wave occurred here, he would be hearing high pitches. This ripple I'm showing you is much akin to these here that I'm showing you on this particular slide. So pick any one of these three and simply move to here and this big ripple indicates the pitch that the person would hear but look at how wide and round it is this is the traveling wave of cochlear action without outer hair cells when you've got healthy outer hair cells look at the action here look what's happening the outer hair cells are stretching and shrinking and pulling this blue membrane down so that the inner hair cells can be activated. Do you see that? You see the outer hair cells are the muscles of the cochlea. They are the action of the cochlea. And this takes place with soft incoming sounds below 50 decibels, helping the, the outer hair cells thereby aiding or helping the inner hair cells to pick up soft sounds with loud sounds coming in. This action isn't necessary. But the result of this outer hair cell action is not only amplification, but it's also sharpening. Look what the outer hair cells do to the waves taking place in the cochlea. Compare this to this. Look at how dull and rounded this is here, and look at how sharp this is. It's amplified and sharpened enabling the person to distinguish between frequencies close together. That's the point. With damage to the outer hair cells, people cannot distinguish. It's like poorer frequency resolution, poorer things are blurred. Think of a vision, a camera with a blurry lens, okay? Here you're getting an inability to distinguish between pitches close together. And that's why hearing impaired people often say they have difficulty hearing in noise. They can't separate frequencies close together. They have lost the action of outer hair cells. And noise-induced hearing loss kills off outer hair cells, just like presbycusis, the most common cause of hearing loss, aging. Autoacoustic emissions now are a result of that action of the outer hair cells. Nothing comes for free. When you work hard, you sweat. That's a byproduct of your work. With a lot of electricity going through a wire, the wire gets hot. That's a byproduct, a light bulb with heat. The light's the main thing, but the heat is the byproduct. Okay, and Oto ear, acoustic sound emissions coming out are a result of outer hair cells working their proverbial butts off. And now autoacoustic emissions are a very fine measurement 
of outer hair cell action. If you have outer hair cell damage, you will have elevated or absent acoustic reflexes. Here's what's happened, or, or I should say otoacoustic emissions. Look at this closely. They take a probe and put it in your ear canal. They deliver two tones, F1, frequency one, and F2, frequency two. Those are separated by a particular ratio. This has been well researched. The ratio would be one to 1.22, but whatever. The point is when you do that, you are creating a distortion in the cochlea and it produces a distortion product, the purple here or the pink going back out. OK, that's the autoacoustic emission. Distortion product, autoacoustic emissions, DPOAEs, pairs of pure tones of different frequencies, F1 and F2, are presented simultaneously through a probe. And what you're doing, so you can see in the picture here, the speaker in the ear canal, sending the sound through the ear canal, through the middle ear, the, ma the, hit, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, or the malleus, incus, and stapes, activating outer hair cells, and thus producing a distortion product, autoacoustic emission, which goes back out through the middle ear. Yes, the ear now working in reverse, and out of the ear canal, and picked up by a microphone. When they present those tones, F1 and F2, here they are on a spectrum, you have several different distortion products, but this 2F1 minus F2 is the one that's usually measured because it's largest. There's, there are others, but they're not as large. But it just goes to show you, shows to go you. <laughs> the cochlea is also an amplifier. The outer hair cells are the miniature amplifiers in the cochlea, helping to amplify the size of traveling waves and also sharpening the peaks of those waves, enabling you to hear sounds below 50 decibels, but also an ability in enabling you to distinguish among frequencies that are close together. It's that twofold action amplification of soft in incoming sounds and sharpening the resolution of the in inner ear, sharpening its ability to distinguish between pitches that are close together. Now that is an elegant organ, the august majesty of the inner ear. This was actually uh, found by a man by the name of Kemp, K-E-M-P, in, in the UK, who discovered autoacoustic emissions about 25, 30 years ago. This is quite something. These are my autoacoustic emissions. The green is the noise floor in my ear canal, just whatever noise is taking place in my ear canal. The red shows the presence of autoacoustic emissions in my ear. And notice they drop off in the very highs, showing that I'm going to have hair, hearing loss in the very high frequencies, showing that I have some outer hair cell damage in the very high frequencies. Here's the two tones put in the ear and look at the autoacoustic emission present. And you're looking at this blue arrow, it will be present at that particular frequency. But notice over here, when the two tones are put into the ear surrounding the very high frequencies, notice the autoacoustic emission is gone. Look, there's no autoacoustic emission here. OK, so pairs of frequencies are placed around the low frequencies, around 125, around 250, around 500, around 1000, and you're looking to find if autoacoustic emissions occur when you present the pairs of tones around particular frequencies, separated by that particular ratio of 1 to 1.22. So if a thousand hertz was frequency one, the second frequency would be 1220. If the second, and then moving up higher, if, this, if the next frequency was 2000 hertz, the, the, its pair would be 2440. You know what I'm saying? So, and they're looking for the presence of autoacoustic emissions, which tells you the presence of outer hair cells, meaning the outer hair cells are healthy. 
In noise-induced hearing loss, the outer hair cells would show no autoacoustic emissions around the high frequencies. Why can we not hear autoacoustic emissions? Well, look at this slide carefully. This tympanic membrane is your eardrum. That's the word for eardrum. And look at the bones of the middle ear, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Look at how small the stirrup is compared to the eardrum, okay? This is what we need to look at here, okay? If you put your hand against the side of your face, do that with me. Take your, your hand and push it against your cheek really hard. Now stop and take your fingertip and push that against your cheek really hard. Notice that hurts. Pressure is force over an area. So when incoming sound hits an eardrum, which is about as big as the tip of your finger, it get that pressure, that force gets converged onto a small area, increasing the pressure of sound, increasing the decibels. You need that because the inner ear is filled with fluid. If you have your head under a swimming pool and I'm standing on the outside talking to you, my sound is going to bounce off the water. You're not going to hear a word I say. Something has to help airborne sound activate a fluid filled cochlea or inner ear. And that something is the middle ear and its bones. That's why you have a middle ear, so you can increase the incoming airborne sound pressure. That's why mammals can hear better than reptiles, because reptiles don't have much of, an, of a middle ear. We do. Maybe that's how we got away from the dinosaurs. Who knows? Anyway, my point is if sound is coming the opposite way. If you have autoacoustic emissions, they're going leftward. They're, 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 the, sound, the, the pressure is being dissipated over a bigger area, and so you lose the sound pressure, and that's why you don't hear autoacoustic emissions. OK, this just FYI. So look at the size of the drum compared to the tiny little foot plate of the stirrup bone, which is connecting the middle ear to the inner ear. Pressure is force over an area. Force over a big area isn't much pressure, but the same force over a small area definitely increases the pressure. That's why a knife will cut through bread. A knife has a tiny sharp edge and the force of your arm or wrist against that knife can cut the bread in, in two, no problem. Pressure is force over an area. So looking at the ear canal now and its resonance, this is the most reasonable explanation for the unique shape of noise induced loss. Check this out. Why do your ears have this shape? And why are your ear canals about one inch or two and a half centimeters in length? Outer ear canals have a resonance, much like wine glasses do on a Christmas day. When you lick your finger and you move it around the rim of the glass, the glass is resonating. Well, your outer ear is no exception. It's a cup as well. And look at its resonance. It starts to resonate past a thousand cycles per second, around 1500 cycles per second of sound. In other words, the frequency of 1500. Now remember, as I said earlier, 125 is low C, 250 is middle C on a piano, 500 would be high C in music. Looking higher in pitch, you are leaving music now and you're getting into sharp consonantal sounds. OK, like again, uh, think of the words hat, sat, bat, cat. They all have a, ah, a. Ah. Vowels are cheap. You've got five vowels and thousands of words. Every word has a vowel. Vowels are cheap. They don't tell you what, what the word is. The high pitched consonants tell you what the word is, which is why people with high pitched hearing loss are saying young people mumble. OK, but look at the look at the resonance of the outer ear. It's nature's gift to help you hear the high frequency consonants. Look at how many decibels it's offering an extra 20 decibels. So the outer ear canal resonates around 1500 to 4000 cycles or Hertz H E R 
TZ, okay? And with a peak at 2700 cycles or Hertz. So you want more detail? Fine, be that way, okay? Number three would be the resonance of the ear, of the bowl of your ear, which you put your finger in, okay? When you're gonna scratch your ear. Number five would be the ear canal and ear drum. Adding all these factors together, you've got T for total, the total resonance, resonating slightly higher than 2,000 cycles and offering you about 20 decibels. So this picture complicated my picture a little simpler, but the same message holding true. And speech sounds on an audiogram. It's all about those sounds between 1,500 and 4,000. Look at these consonants. OK, they're not only softer in decibels, but they're higher in pitch. The outer ear shape and its canal naturally adds decibels to these high pitched consonants, which are harder to hear. I guess one could say if we didn't speak, our ears wouldn't have the shape that they do. OK, the ear and the voice are married together. The outer ear is what they call in science a quarter wave resonator. It resonates with sound waves that are four times its length. I didn't make this up. It's a cylinder closed at one end. All cylinders closed at one end are quarter wave resonators. The outer ear resonates with sound waves four times its length. Do the math. OK, that's what it's going to resonate most with high pitched sounds around 3000 cycles per second. If you prefer inches, the same logic could be held over there. OK, it's going to resonate with sounds around 3000 cycles per second. So spectra of noises. If you look at the top left, the spectrum of typical industrial noise, mostly low frequency. Most noises are low frequency. But the ear canal resonance is shown on the right, top right, and it's going to filter that noise. And so the noise at the, no at the eardrum will be shaped much like the noise at your, much like the resonance of your outer ear canal. So this bottom central piece is showing you what the outer ear is doing to the spectrum of noise top left. OK, so this is has a big contribution to the shape of noise induced loss. Noise induced loss and the half octave shift. Most industrial noises are broad band in frequency, meaning they have a lot of different frequencies in them. And most of the noise industrial noises are concentrated toward the lower pitches. The ear canal resonance creates a band pass filter centered around 3000 cycles or Hertz HZ. Be glad I'm not in talking from the US HZ. That's how they call a Z a Z. <laughs> Ted, that's a Z. That's not a Z. Anyhow, the basilar membrane is the hair cell floor. OK, that I showed you earlier in this talk, the basilar membrane waves that take place, those traveling waves I was talking to you about, tend to be largest about a half an octave higher than the frequency of the incoming sound. And basically what you're looking at is this. There's the resonance of the outer ear canal on top of the audiogram, shift it to the right about a half an octave, and flip it upside down and what do you got? Noise damages hair cells in a region about half an octave higher than the pitch of the incoming noise, known as the half octave shift. This explains why noise induced hearing loss has its shape. It has to do with the outer ear canal resonance shape. And again, the, 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 the motion of the floor of the hair cell region tends to be biggest about a half an octave toward the higher pitches. That's just the physics of the ear. Anyway, basically, in a nutshell, you could say it's the resonance of the outer ear canal flipped upside down and shifted a tad to the right, giving you 
noise induced hearing loss, which is why you see some recuperation often at 8000 cycles. Presbycusis, aging hearing loss, would be simply a slope down. Follow my cursor. It would just be a slope down toward the right. Better hearing in the base and poorer hearing toward the treble. It would be trouble here, trouble with treble, okay? The trouble with treble. <laughs> but noise induced hearing loss tends to have this precipice that takes place around 2000 cycles and then a plummeting drop, a precipitous drop in hearing. Excellent hearing for the low pitches of 125 and 250 and 500. Excellent hearing for the middle pitches of 1000 to 2000 with a sudden drop in hearing past that. And then a bit of recuperation at 8000 cycles. So noise induced, again, my talk today to you isn't highlighting utmost familiarity with BOHS, British Occupational Hygiene Society, but I really am indebted to, to Jans for inviting me to talk to you about some of the causes and some of the nature of the damage that does take place in the inner ear due to ex excessive noise. Now, not everyone is equally susceptible to noise induced hearing loss. Some people have tough ears, some have tender ears, possibly due to different ear canals. EAMS simply stands for external auditory meatus, meaning tunnel, ear canal, possibly due to different middle ear structures, slightly, possibly due to different cochleas, who knows? The variability in ear canal resonance affects the degree of consequent noise induced hearing loss. It is said that People with more resonance toward the higher pitches of this resonance versus 2000, the lower frequencies of that resonance, they tend to show more noise induced hearing loss after noise. But again, the research is sort of sketchy. Those with similar resonances at 2000 and 4000 tend to show a bit less noise induced hearing loss after exposure, but basically, all, I'm, all I am saying to you is that there is some variability. If you took 10 people and exposed them each to exactly the same noise, you might have slight differences in hearing loss as a result. Basically, cochleas can differ across people as well. So you have natural differences, but basically normal inner and outer hair cells damaged hair cells and look where the damage is mostly. The damage is mostly to the outer hair cells, not the inners. It's the outers that are the princesses, that are the spoiled little ones that tend to get damaged first. Outer hair cells tend to become damaged before inners with ototoxicity in drugs, certain medications, with aging, the most common cause of hearing loss, presbycusis, mostly outer hair cell damage, and noise-induced hearing loss, mostly outer hair cell damage. Noise-induced hearing loss is often asymmetrical, depending on which ear got most exposure. Hunters typically show noise-induced hearing loss opposite to the shoulder where the rifle was held. That's because you've got 10 pounds of ugly fat blocking, <laughs> known as your head, blocking the non-exposed ear when holding a rifle, okay? Right-handed hunters tend to show more noise-induced hearing loss in the left ear. So here what is what they call cytocochleograms. You're looking at hair cell regions. If you've unrolled the cochlea, and by the way, if you unroll the cochlea, it would be a little bit more than an inch long. It would be about three centimeters in length if you unrolled that snail shell. It has about two and a half coils, two and a half turns. Anyway, say they've unrolled the cochlea and now you're looking at the inner hair cells on the top for the right ear and the three rows of outer hair cells, let's say, in this person, and you're looking at the at the damage that took place. Well, in this person's right ear, okay, cytocochleograms of two ears of a, of a person who was a hunter, and you can see that the right ear has less damage than the left ear because this right-handed hunter has had his left ear more exposed to the rifle 
noise, thus showing more damage to the hair cells in the left ear, especially over the high pitch region. Notice at the right hand side where it says base. The base of the cochlea, the wide end of the cochlea, is the high pitches of the cochlea. The pointy apex of the cochlea, as you may recall, is the low frequency representation of the cochlea. Much like keys on a piano, specific pitches are represented along specific places if you unroll the cochlea. Now, Noise, the thermometer. Well, this is all typical stuff that's shown a thousand times, but basically 30 decibels at the bottom is really soft. Ambient room noise when you are not talking is around 30 to 40 decibels. Average conversational speech is around 65 to 70 decibels. Yelling would be around 85 to 90 decibels. And 85 to 90 is what starts to cause permanent hearing loss. So people look at this. Zero would be the faintest sound heard by a human ear. This is not always quite true. A whisper in a quiet library 30, I would say it's probably around 45, 50. The quiet library or ambient room noise itself might be 30. Normal conversation would be 60 to 70 and then getting louder as you move on down. This is kind of a strange one. Look, look at the specifics that they give you here. This is a little bit too much, but when you're looking at the very top here, extremely loud transient sounds. And then you're looking at more continuous loud sounds. And then you're, you're starting to get a bit softer. But when you're down to power saws or leaf blowers, by the way, leaf blowers, I'll never understand them. It's called a rake. Rake your ding dong leaves yeah, instead of blowing them onto the neighbor's lawn. Honest to Pete. Anyhow, working your way down here at the very bottom, I've said, don't believe this stuff here. That's a little bit odd where you're getting very quiet. Yeah, that would be around 30, but uh, at any rate, conversational noise would be around 60 to 70. A loud noise exposure depends on two things as you might have learned by now, the intensity of the noise and the length of time you are exposed to the noise. And different laws are in effect in different jurisdictions. Some provinces in Canada differ slightly from others. Various states in the United States would have slight differences. I would imagine it would be the same thing across Europe. But essentially, the purpose of this particular slide is mainly to show you that around 85, 87, at eight hours a day, now you stand in danger of permanent noise-induced loss. And for each five decibels an increase in noise level, the exposure time tends to be cut in half. So for example, 90 for four hours a day, 95 for two hours, 100 for one hour, and 105 for a half an hour. Ex just basically telling you that as you increase the level of the noise, the allowed exposure time basically is cut in half. And what's with this A behind the things? Let's just kind of digress for a second here. It is the weighting of sound level meters to address the fact that humans hear some pitches better than others. The outer ear canal has a resonance and so does the middle ear. They have resonance and they make you hear 1000 to 4000 hertz the best. Okay, essentially the middle ear, look at it here. The eardrum, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, or the malleus, incus, and stapes bones. And again, look at the size of the drum compared to the size of the stapes bone. Thus, the middle ear increases the pressure of incoming sound so it can activate a fluid-filled cochlea or inner ear, but it also has resonances to it. And so when you take the resonance of your outer ear canal and the resonances of your middle ear, basically you've got a couple of smiles at the bottom, meaning that the sounds between 1000 hertz and 4000 hertz or cycles are heard at least intensity. Our ears are better 
at hearing those particular frequencies due to the resonances of the middle ear and the outer ears. And basically, if you take that fact with one ear under a headphone, and by the way, there's two lines here. The yellow simply means if you're sitting there one yard or one meter in front of a speaker listening with two ears, and the white simply means if you're doing the same thing but listening with one ear under a headphone. And that's what's done in a hearing test. OK, so you'll see that smile again, that uneven hearing sensitivity. Well, guess what? These differences are built into audiometric test equipment. 125 is actually 40 decibels. 250 is actually about 25 decibels. 500 is about 12 decibels and so on. Those differences are built in. So when you see zero on a hearing test, that reflects this curve. That red flat line is the white curve here. OK, so this is in dB sound pressure level. This is in dB hearing level. All right, so this is zero for humans, and that's why you had that curve in sound level meters that are used to test hearing, and that's what that A reflects. Just wanted to tell you that, OK? So here's a lot of words, and it's mainly to say this. People in non-industrial societies have better hearing as they age than people in developed Western societies, and that's because they have less noise pollution. Noise is a pollution. It's the second most common cause of hearing loss in the book. OK, so Canadians, Europeans, American, the elderly here have slightly worse hearing than elderly would in Africa because Africa has less noise pollution. Our ears were never meant to hear the clanging of steel on steel. Our ears were meant to hear soft voices over the crackling of a fire and the occasional rumble of thunder in the distance or perhaps the roar of a lion but we were never meant to hear the sounds that we hear, okay, in industrial society. Noise pollution is going to be the death of us all when it comes to hearing loss. TTS is temporary threshold shift. PTS is permanent threshold shift. This is, a, that this is simply, threshold is simply the softest you can hear. Sounds loud enough to cause hearing loss give temporary hearing loss. It's like walking over your grass. The blades will eventually stand up again. The hairs of the hair cells will eventually stand up again. Experienced after a loud concert or working with loud tools after rest, temporary threshold shift recovers to normal hearing again. But if you keep on exposing, the grass blades die. The hair cells die. The hairs never do rise back up again, and that becomes permanent threshold shift. And so looking at hearing loss due to noise over the time of exposure, showing you the gradual loss of hearing in the very high frequencies. And this particular picture isn't always so accurate because at 6,000 hertz, well, actually that it's not bad. 8,000 hertz, they're not showing you, but you would show some recovery, some slightly you'd see the curves going back up again, again, due to the shape of the resonances of the outer ear. Noise induced hearing loss versus acoustic trauma. So if you have a sudden loud explosion for a few milliseconds, like a, a rifle blast, that can cause immediate hearing loss. Most often, however, noise induced hearing loss is caused by repeated ongoing noise exposure. And the risk, of course, depends on the intensity and the length of exposure. Someone exposed to to having to to a gas engine lawnmower for the for some time, as opposed to a, using a, a chainsaw, which is louder. Okay, again, there's that inverse relationship between the intensity and a loud length of exposure for the for the most part. So, warning symptoms would be difficulty hearing what someone is saying, not that someone's talking. What they said, and that's precisely because of an inability to hear the high frequency consonants of speech. 
That's what the elderly say. Young people mumble. I can hear just plainly. I just can't tell whether they said dishes or fishes, kittens or mittens, cat or fat. Okay, they're always using context to fill in what must have been said. Feeling of fullness in ears after leaving a noisy place or ringing or buzzing. Tinnitus is the most is most commonly associated with noise induced hearing loss and the pitch of the tinnitus is usually high pitched and it's usually represents the high pitch region where the hair cells are damaged. Common hearing loss prevention devices. Yellow earplugs are kind of nice. The spongy ones, not bad, but people don't tend to put them in deep enough. You should squeeze them and roll them and stick them into the ear all the way and then allow them to expand. Some reusable earplugs are used at times. Sound, sound isolating earphones can be used, but stereo headphones are the best, actually. They block out about 30 decibels, which is great. Special purpose headsets allow you to hear if you need to if someone's talking, but uh, you know, it, it's gonna be like a pilot in, in, in a plane. But the bottom one, musicians earplugs are simply sleeves that fit in the ear, ear canal and they block out the sound, but they preserve the outer ear canal resonance. That's why they cost so much. <clears throat> they enable you to hear speech while yet blocking out hair cell damaging noise. And that's because they, they are frequency specific in the way that they block out sound. They preserve the outer ear canal resonance. They preserve that shape when they're blocking out the sound. Very interesting. So <clears throat> when you look at how much earplugs block out sound, cotton balls, not very good. A little bit, but not very good. Foam plugs at the bottom, not bad. They'll block out about 30 decibels and even more in the very high pitches. But the musician's earplugs, the ones that I was talking about here, the musician's earplugs are the best. They'll block out about 15, but they will really allow, they, they, they tend to preserve the outer ear canal resonance. You can get the nines, the 15s or 25, that just gives you an idea of how much sound is blocked out. Again, they don't block out as much as a foam earplug does. No, they don't, but they're still pretty good because here's the un unprotected ear with its ear canal resonance, and here's what happens with the ER15 earplug, musician's earplug. You're simply reducing things by about 15, but you're preserving that ear canal resonance. And that's why if you need to hear speech while you're blocking out noise, musicians earplugs tend to be the best choice. Remember noise induced hearing loss is the second most common cause of SNHL, meaning sensory neural hearing loss. Listen, or look or whatever. There's two types of hearing loss, conductive and sensory neural. Conductive simply means a blockage of sound caused by wax, caused by middle ear infection. Conductive hearing loss is a mechanical blockage of sound getting to where it's got to go. Vision loss is conductive because the back of the eye, the retina, changes light into electricity and the eyeball is either too long or too short. So you go to the store and you buy glasses to refocus light upon an intact retina. That's why optometrists have it made in the shade because vision loss is simple, easy to fix, but hearing loss would be like me going to the back of your eyes and scratching your retinas. Now go ahead and wear your glasses. That's sensory neural. The inner ear or cochlea with its hair cells is in quotes the retina of the ear. And in 95% of hearing loss, it's that which is damaged. Okay, and that's what's meant by sensory neural hearing loss. Damage to the hair cells. There's no mechanical blockage. This is not medically treatable. It's permanent. Okay, someone went through your hair cells with a rake and damaged the hair cells. We all know not to look at the sun. 
but for some reason we tend to think that the ear is impervious to the ravages of noise. Well, here the American word ain't, okay? Noise-induced loss is also the most preventable type of hearing loss, and that's the sad thing about it. Anyway, what's your noise? I guess one of these guys would be Jans, one would be Lee, this would be me trying to have, trying to get on to this uh, presentation today. Glad it finally did work, but here you go. That's the end of my particular talk. I'll be happy to entertain questions, come what may. All right, good stuff. Glad to be here. Ah, all right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ted. It's a, it's a great presentation. And I, I like how you mentioned that our ears were not made uh, to be exposed to, to industrial noise. No. And, um, and I, I, I like to use the, the, the same um, metaphor, but when it comes to exposure to chemicals in, in, in occupational mm -hmm. hygiene, yeah. uh, that you know, people, the, people went through evolution in the environment where water and food was polluted, uh, but air was clean, so they developed strong uh, gastrointestinal system, uh, but uh, there is no much protection mechanisms in lung. Uh, but uh -huh. now, you know, in the industrial environment, people are, well now, with public health improvement, water and food is clean, so there yeah. is no need yeah. for such a robust GI system, right. but our air is polluted, mm -hmm. and we just have no time to develop um, protection mechanisms, you know, to mm -hmm. have them. So that, yeah. that metaphor resonates with me. Uh-huh. Well, I, what I find too is that hearing loss, be, people believe what they see and you can't see hearing loss. You can see blindness because the white cane is there and people lend an arm to help across the street. But uh, hearing loss, when elderly Mrs. Jones asks for the third time, how much is the cost of the bananas and the young person just gets impatient with her, it's hearing loss is invisible. And it's a it's an underestimated sense. It's our communicative sense. It if it's the only sense that not only affects yourself, but it affects others around you because it's a communicative sense. I'd be happy to answer questions that others might have at this particular time. I did see someone had something in a chat box, but uh, oh, there you go. I'm seeing some things. All right, oh, I'm glad to see some people liked it. <laughs> glad we got over the trouble of finally sharing the screen. That uh, that was that was that worked out pretty good. I'm not sure what um, you did. You see me talking on the side. I'm not 100% sure. I just stopped alternating between sharing screen. I thought I'd better not blow that one. I better stick to Snickers and just <laughs> keep the PowerPoint slides up. But there we yeah, go. We saw both. We saw both. We saw you. We saw presentation. And as you were speaking, there was a lot of questions. And I, I, I took them out and I'm going to fire them at you. Some of them, as I was reading, I was like, that's that's way above my comprehension. So when I'm reading those, <laughs> I probably don't understand what being asked, uh, but I hope you do. Go um, ahead. I just wanted to make a quick annou announcement um, before we go into Q&A. Um, who, um, we, you, you can request a certificate of attendance uh, from this webinar by emailing uh, at marketing at bohs.org uh, and you'll get a certificate of attendance for this webinar. Uh, but let's go uh, straight to questions. And um, the first question that we have for Ted is, does exposure to autotoxic chemicals produce the same pattern of hearing loss as noise induced hearing loss? Not really. It, <clears throat> I shouldn't, you know, in a way, yes, but not exactly the same shape. Ototoxic drugs tend to kill off the high pitches first. And there's a reason for that. Let me give you an analogy. When you walk into your living room or when you walk into your house, there's a mat in front of the door and the mat is what gets dirty first. All sounds entering the cochlea or activating the cochlea have to go through the high pitch regions to get to anywhere else in the cochlea. And that's why highs tend to be damaged before 
lows, which are ensconced way deeper toward the apex or the point of the cochlea. So the point of the cochlea represents the low frequencies and the wider spirals at the bottom would be the high frequencies. And all sounds activate that wide bottom before activating the very tippy top. And yeah, aging, ototoxicity and ototoxic drugs are often um, antibiotics ending with the suffix mycin, M-Y-C-I-N, streptomycin, canamycin, vanamycin. They're great for fighting tuberculosis and infections thereof, but they were known to cause ototoxic effects. And so hair cells would become damaged. I guess you'd better have the hearing loss than be taken it than, than die. But that now erythromycin is not ototoxic, but all the other ones ending in mycin, same with aspirin, aspirin. It's not a hair cell killer, but it will cause ringing in the ears. When you stop taking the aspirin, the ringing in the ears dissipate, but aspirin does not cause hair cell damage. But quinine for malaria, that's an ototoxic drug. And, uh, and again, the antibiotics, they're called aminoglycosides, aminoglycosides. A-M-I-N-O-G-L-Y-C-O-S-I-D-E-S. -E anyway, those. But they tend to cause high-pitched hearing loss first. Similar to noise, but not exactly the same shape. But in a, having some similarities, to answer your question. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, we have another one. Um, you on, with us, Ted? You online? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Just for a second. Uh, what causes one to have constant buzzing in the ear as a result of noise-induced hearing loss? It's an in. It's a very complicated uh, reason, but it's basically an imbalance between brain going and brain exiting auditory information. The brain is getting error messages from damaged hair cells, and doesn't quite know what to do about those. The best thing for them, which is, and what you're talking about is tinnitus. And tinnitus affects a lot of people. Some people, you can have hearing loss without tinnitus, so it makes sense you can also have tinnitus without hearing loss. So, but get a test done because it, tinnitus is, can be easily masked or covered with a little bit of background noise. Don't make the cure worse than the disease. If you have a hearing loss and you have tinnitus, guess what one of the best solutions is? Hearing aids. Because what's the curse of hearing aids? Background noise. Well, that cloud turns into a silver lining when it comes to tinnitus because you're masking or covering the tinnitus to some degree. A big thing about ringing in the ear is the anxiety caused by it. Think about it like this. You're trying to sleep and a person across the hallway in a bedroom across the hallway is snoring loudly. You can't hear the snoring very loud, but you can still hear it. How bad are you going to let it bug you? You're trying to sleep and you can hear the drip of a kitchen faucet. It's really not that loud, but how bad are you going to let it bug you? So tinnitus has a very psychological component as well. It's there but the only person who hears it is the person who experiences it. It's not an objective sound and never confuse tinnitus with autoacoustic emissions. They are vastly different. OAEs are objective sounds that can literally be measured with a microphone in the ear. They're used to test infants to screen for hearing loss. They're used to test liars, people who are lying about results, and they're also used as early detection of outer hair cell damage. So they're a very fine type of test to be used for noise-induced loss. But nonetheless, to answer your question, yet yeah, tinnitus is a real issue. You can Google up tinnitus and you'll find a myriad of things, but basically it can be maddening if you let it. Thank you for this answer. Um, a question from myself that I want to squeeze in, and uh, the reason I organized all of this 
to have this opportunity to ask. And uh, something that I was um, thinking about a lot recently, uh, can you use autoacoustic emissions um, instead of audiometry in occupational setting uh, to identify people uh, with early signs of noise-induced hearing loss? Because uh, to my understanding, it's a leading indicator of noise-induced hearing loss compared to audiometry, which just uh, establishes the fact that hearing loss already happened. Mm -hmm. I, I would re recommend doing a hearing test first as a screening. Test 500, 1000, 2004, 5, 1, 2, and 4. And basically, if you're showing a loss at 4000, just in, then do OAEs, autoacoustic emissions. Remember a hearing test to be complete. You're doing air conduction, testing by headphones, and then doing bone conduction, which is a further test. Don't do all of that. Just a quick screening of headphone testing at 500, 1000, 2004. If you have a loss at 4000, which is a sign of NIHL, then do OAEs. That's what I would do because I say that because the here one's the gross test and one's the fine test. And you may have variations among hair cell damage in autoacoustic emissions, even among normal hearing people. And I guess that's why you might get a lot of false positives with only OAE testing. Interesting. Okay. Um. There was one question that I will attempt to answer before we go into territory where I don't understand what I'm actually asking. <laughs> and uh, that question was if um, if a person with pre-existing hearing loss needs to wear the same hearing protection uh, uh, as other workers working in the area with elevated noise levels. And uh, what I would suggest is to um, to see. How, how big is pre-existing hearing loss and to superimpose it on, um, on the estimates of attenuation provided by the hearing device. Uh, so for example, UK HSC has a very good um, Excel spreadsheet. It's like a calculator where you can do your SNR, HML or Octaband attenuation methods and it will provide you with a graph. Actually, I think I can show it here. Something like this. So it shows you what the noise exposures are outside of hearing protection device and inside of hearing protection device. And it will also tell you if there is a risk of overprotection. So that's usually if uh, the noise inside of your inside your hearing protection device is less than 70 decibels, then usually it would mean that the person is overprotected. Uh, the person might uh, feel isolated and it might lead to taking out a hearing protection. So try to superimpose what is the estimated noise reduction and what uh, and subtract it and subtract hearing loss from that estimate. That would be my suggestion. Uh, Ted, do you have anything to add from audio audio's <coughs> perspective? Yeah, if someone has is deaf as a post, <laughs> you know, I mean I've known deaf people like you know they, they they literally can't hear anything till it's around 110 120 they're not actually going to be a, be affected by much noise if someone has a moderate hearing loss however you want to protect what you've got and i guess i would err on the side of caution just saying you know it might be a good idea to make sure this doesn't get any worse but to be sure, if you've got an inability to hear certain frequencies, why, if, if it ain't broke, why fix it? I mean, that's why that DBA scale exists in the first place as well. It represents the curve of human sen <clears throat> hearing sensitivity. And if you can't hear the low pitches very well, then why are you <clears throat> providing an equal amount of noise protection against those? And that's where that A comes from in DBA, representing the sensitivity of the sound level meter used to test your hearing. It's normally less sensitive to the, to the very low frequencies to, so that it imitates 
the actual hearing sensitivity across the frequencies of your ears in the first place. So, yeah, you have a point there. I mean, if someone has the hearing loss, you can deduce some of that from the level of the noise that would cause the hearing loss. But thinking with broad strokes, if someone has a mild to moderate hearing loss, meaning 25 decibels to around 50 decibel hearing loss, 25 in the lows to around 50 in the highs, which is typical, 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 the most common degree of sensory neural loss, I would tend to advise the person when you're getting on your lawnmower or when you're working in your garage with loud equipment, I'd protect your ears anyway. Just to, you know what, why may, why risk in getting it worse? Good point. Uh, okay, so this question um, to you, for you, Ted, um, and it says, um, what is your opinion and clinical experience on the gray area between noise-induced uh, hearing loss and the autotoxic exposure and the pre-existing health conditions and the differential, differential diagnostics uh, between autotoxic chemicals induced hearing loss and the vast number of hearing loss uh, causes such as more than 1,000 known gene mutations that can cause different levels of hearing loss. You know, sometimes the, the most complicated things are answered with the most simple inquiries, and that is any good hearing test begins with a case history. And so I would be asking the person if he or she has been exposed to noise. I would be asking the person if he or she has had medical conditions whereby one is taking medication. And if so, can I see the medications, please? Can I write down what they are? And so on. Does hearing loss run in your family? There's another question. Does your grandmother, grandparents, does it run in your family? That would look, be looking at the genetic thing. So the, sometimes the simplest explanation can be the best one. And noise-induced hearing loss shapes can differ among people. You'll have variations. Presbycusis, aging hearing, will have variations among people. And ototoxicity will show variations among people. And same with genetic. Genetic hearing losses are interesting. Sometimes they're called cookie bite. Genetic hearing losses are often earmarked, <laughs> excuse the pun, by decent hearing in the lows, <clears throat> excuse me, and decent hearing in the very highs, but poorest hearing in the mid frequencies, much like a cookie bite. And so when you see someone with a cookie bite hearing loss, like a U shape, it's unusual but it's, um, it's, it's not caused by noise and it's not caused by aging. It's usually genetic. So there's, there's variations across different causes of hearing loss. It's not really an exact noise-induced hearing loss looks exactly like this. But my presentation to you is mainly just to show you the general shape of it and how you differentiate it from most other hearing losses. But again, I reiterate, a good case history at the very beginning, at the outset, is really what we teach our students to do so that you can make sense of the comprehensive test results that, you, that you'll find. Excellent. Thank you for this answer. Um, and another one for me to nail uh, without understanding what is actually being asked. <laughs> is uh, could the shape of the noise induced hearing loss has to do with the fact that the cochlea is tono tonotopic and that the wave created by the stage's movement creates a mechanical impact in the first curve of the cochlea damaging the hair cells on that area which is related to the 4 kilohertz frequency yep that is a, that is an oft mentioned reason and it, it is a possibility, a mechanical, so, so to speak, a backwater 
type of effect, much like a, an ore in the water causing its particular curve. Some say that that kind of a ripple of fluid near the base or the bottom turn of the cochlea may affect the, the high frequencies around 4000 Hertz. I have that's how I was taught when I studied audiology. It was later that I that I worked or, or did what do you call a presentation along with one Donald Henderson PhD at the University of New York Buffalo. Yeah, believe it or not, there's a town in New York called Buffalo. <laughs> at any rate, he uh, suggested actually to me a more elegant reason and a more plausible reason and, they, and that was the outer ear canal resonance shape with the half octave shift as I mentioned earlier. But yes, the, to the cochlea is indeed tonotopic. I'm really glad you use that word. It's a, that, because and tonotopic simply means specific frequencies are represented in specific places, much like the keys on a piano. So indeed, you know, the very fact that that the cochlea is tonotopic would mean that the hearing loss would occur either due to the region, the reason you've mentioned about that motion of fluid most affecting the 4000 hertz region or the explanation I gave regarding the outer ear canal resonance and that half octave shift either would explain the fact that 4,000 and 6,000 hertz tend to be most affected due to the fact that, yeah, the cochlea is indeed tonotopic. It's, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that or highlight that again. Thank you for this answer, Ted. Um, and we have, have had a question from uh, your overseas colleague, audiologist, Rob Shepard. And ah. uh, the question says, um, would you suggest that autoacoustic emissions as the fine test of OHC function are useful as long longitudinal measurement or leading indicator of changes in cochlear function as a result of exposure? Absolutely. I completely agree with that. I mean, it is also autoacoustic emissions are also used to track ototoxicity. So let's say you have someone who's necessarily needing to take a drug that is known to be ototoxic. OAEs are done periodically to assess the progressive nature of outer hair cell damage due to the prolonged taking of that particular drug. So that by that same reason, following noise-induced hearing loss or noise exposure, repeated testing of autoacoustic emissions over time would indeed be looking at outer hair cell function under a microscope. And you would be tracking and keeping records of the, of the status of autoacoustic emissions over time you know, as the person it continues at noise exposure, or if the person's protecting now, wearing proper ear protection, have the autoacoustic emission stabilized. Excellent, thank you very much. And uh, we have a question, uh, I believe, from someone who is practicing occupational hygiene in Brazil, and it says, in Brazil, it is a legal requirement to have the audiometry done after a noise rest of 14 hours. Yep. But what is your opinion on taking only the pre-admission audiometry with that rest time and the sequential tests during the work shift? The goal would be to be able to determine the existence of temporary threshold shifts, and so this would be a better tool to prevent permanent noise-induced hearing loss. Well, I, uh, if I were testing someone who had uh, a history of noise exposure, my first thing would be to test that person the following morning, re which is running like that person was mentioning 14 hours or, or whatever, giving the hair cells time to rest. I want to find a baseline. I want to find an actual baseline of that person's best hearing. So if I'm testing that person right after exposure due to noise, I'm not getting his or her true hearing levels as they would be at rest. So that's why most testing is done in the morning. 
OK, when the, at the beginning of someone's shift of work. And yeah, if you tested someone's hearing later in the day after the noise exposure, that might give you a grip or a knowledge of the TTS, the temporary threshold shift that may occur while that person has been exposed to noise throughout the day. Oh yeah, that's I, I would say of interest, sure. But uh, my main thing would be to test that. I want to find out what that person's baseline hearing is at best. That to me, that would be the most important thing. But sure, testing later on in the day to find out the TTS that may have occurred is also information that 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 can be useful. But it's uh, you know, the, these are yeah, I was just thinking of something, but uh, that's why in speech testing, in audiometry, many people question, well, why aren't you testing me my speech in noise? Why are you testing me in quiet? Well, because I want to know the baseline of your best speech intelligibility before I start talking about how your speech intelligibility is in noise. Sure, how your speech intelligibility is in noise is a good thing, nothing, it's a good test. But the primary th test, in my opinion, as a clinician, is to find out what's the best it's going to be. So under headphones, in dead quiet, say the word cow, say the word tree, say the word death, say the word death. <laughs> but no, oh yeah, speech words are, of course, phonetically balanced. I digress here, but it's of interest that the words used in speech testing represent all the sounds spoken in the language in the proportion in which they occur. But I digress. That's a not answering this person's question. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. Um, now we have a question that I think many people uh, who are responsible for delivering and managing hearing conservation program will uh, uh, find useful uh, because we operate in uh, in the real world where there are financial and time restrictions. Uh, so the question says, uh, how can we screen a large group of workers for noise induced hearing loss as audiometry takes much longer time? Are there any short term screening methods available? So. Is there anything simpler than audiometry? <clears throat> audiometry, again, as I say, taken comprehensively is involves testing at seven octave frequencies, 125, 250, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, and 8,000. OK, if you want to make it, and then it's done again by bone conduction. So you've tested the right ear at seven frequencies, left ear at seven frequencies, and then bone conduction at, at these frequencies and bone can. No, no, just air conduction testing, headphone testing at five, one, two, and four. Keep it simple. Doesn't take long at all. Just all you're doing is it's a screening test. So screening at four different frequencies is fairly fast. I mean, sure, I mean, if you wanted a, a quicker test, it would be non-behavioral. And by that, I mean requiring no voluntary response on the part of the client. And two tests are non-behavioral. One is called acoustic reflexes. But again, they vary among people. And acoustic reflexes are contraction of your middle ear muscles with sudden loud sounds. And so your, your middle ears contract with two muscles when a sudden loud sound comes in. We used to think that that was nature's protection against loud sounds, untrue. Do you know why you have acoustic reflexes? To dull the loudness of your own voice while you talk. You hear others speaking at 65 or 70 decibels sound pressure level. We hear ourselves talking by air conduction and also through the bone of the skull. So we hear ourselves differently than we hear others. That's why when we hear recordings of ourselves, we, we don't like it. Other people say that sounds just like you. You're the only one that doesn't like the recording of your voice because you are now hearing yourself for the first time only by air conduction and not through the bone of the skull. <laughs> 
So anyway, acoustic reflexes are a way of testing as well, but they vary so much among people. And autoacoustic emissions are good, they they too, but they can vary among people. So, but again, yeah, OAEs will take about five minutes to test. A screening test might take about seven. So you know what I'm saying? It's kind of six of one and half a dozen of the other. If you're doing just a screening test, remember, you're not doing the whole ding dong show. You're screening. Thank you, Ted. Um, I'll do one more last question for you, and then I'll try to answer uh, two simple questions related to uh, oak hygiene, and uh, then we can uh, wrap it up. Um, but uh, one last question uh, related to audiometry. Uh, can a temporary threshold shift due to infection result in a permanent threshold shift if the infection is not treated, not treated on time? You're on mute, Ted. Not sure how that happened, but anyway. <laughs> um, infections are usually of the outer ear or middle ear. OK, and infections cause a conductive hearing loss, a mechanical blockage of sound getting to the inner ear where it's got to go. That's only 5% of hearing loss. And guess what? It's medically treatable. OK, so yeah, if you leave those alone and don't treat them, sure, I, things get only get worse. Maybe the infection can now start to reach the inner ear and destroy hair cells. If it's a bacterial infection, you're fried. Your hair cells are gone, OK? But that's pretty rare. It, you might have labyrinthitis, which is a viral infection of the inner ear, and that's going to cause you dizziness and whatever, but eh, they tend to reverse themselves. But so, but normally the inner ear is not something that hair cells are not something normally affected by infections. It's usually the outer ear canal that can get an infection or the middle ear kids earaches. Why do children have more earaches than adults? Because their their faces are squatter. Their jaws are more in. And so the eustachian tubes that connect the back of the throat to the middle ears are more horizontal in children. In teenage puberty, things go like this because your skull gets longer. So you've got gravity working in your favor. So upper respiratory infections don't migrate to the middle ear as easily in adults as they do in children. And that's why children tend to get more earaches than adults do. It's the shape of the face, literally. So it's a that's a, anyway, I digress again, but I, I want to just highlight that infections are usually medically curable and they cause a conductive hearing loss, which is only about 5% of hearing loss in the world. 95% of hearing loss in the world is hair cell damage, which doesn't hurt at all. It's insidious, it creeps up, and gradually, and it's usually others that notice it before you do, and you're denying, denying, denying it because you don't know what the problem is. You just think other people are just being crabby and irritable, but basically you're losing your ability to hear, and so you get tired because you're trying to fill in what must have been said. And Helen Keller said it the best, Vision loss cuts people off from things. Hearing loss cuts people off from people. It's the one sense that necessarily affects other people as well as yourself. It's a, uh, and it's uh, the public takes it for granted. We really do. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a, a, a reality. Comparing vision loss to hearing loss is the best thing one can do. Vision loss is usually conductive. It's easily fixable. You buy these things and guess what? They work. That's why hearing aids are called hearing aids. They aid, but they don't completely fix. They're like a cane for a bad knee. They help, 
but they're not like glasses are because again, the retina of the ear itself is damaged and that's sensory neural loss. The most common is presbycusis. The second most common is noise induced, which is why it's a great topic for BOHS because it is rampant. Watch it. That's all I say or <laughs> protect it. We'll certainly do. Uh, we will watch it here uh, in the UK. Um, two questions uh, that I'll attempt to answer is uh, if companies out there undertaking audiometric database analysis or has that process fallen by the wayside? Um, I can't comment much on it. Uh, from my personal experience, it's a challenge to obtain this information from um, from occupational health provider. Uh, but what has changed is that the updated L108 guidance, uh, which is approved code of practice for the control of noise at work regulations 2005 uh, in the UK, uh, now has paragraph uh, that says that these data should be provided from uh, uh, whoever does audiometry. So you have you at least have some leverage now when, when, you, when you're speaking to your occupational health provider to request, to request that data. And the second question was if noise induced hearing loss is reader reportable. Uh, so reader, for those who's not from the UK, it's a piece of legislation uh, requiring reporting certain uh, incidents, certain injuries and illness, occupational injuries and illnesses to the regulator. And uh, actually, recently, I have been looking for noise induced hearing loss listed there, and I couldn't find it. I need to do a bit more research before answering this question, but I was surprised that it's I couldn't find it there quickly. So unless I do a bit more thorough search and find it, I at the moment, I don't know if it's there. I have not seen it there, um, but uh, it, I might be wrong. Don't quote me on this. Uh, well, time runs out quickly, um, <laughs> and we two and a half hours in. Uh, but yeah, it does run quickly when you have a, such a valuable information imparted on you. And uh, unfortunately, we we approach the end of this webinar. Um, once again, thank you very much, Ted, for presenting for the uh, British Occupational Hygiene Society. Um, listening to your expertise will uh, undoubtedly. Uh, help everyone to increase their competency and uh, advance their careers. Um, so, Ted, um, are there any last words of advice or direction you would like to tell our listeners today? Oh, I think we've uh, just about covered the topic, but uh, again, I wish to thank you for inviting me to speak. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. It's uh, nice to talk uh, in, in a virtual se situation like this, um, that this is all made possible with so many attendees. I, I'm, I'm amazed at how many people have attended. So no, it's been great. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, what did the Beatles say? I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the group and I hope you pass the audition. There we go. Mm -hmm. We'll see you when nice. we look at you. Live long and prosper. Well, on this note, uh, we will conclude this webinar. Uh, thanks everyone for attending this meeting today. Uh, it is incredible to see such a great turnout and to realize that we are uh, all one big international team uh, working on the same goal of workers' health protection. If you have any more questions or comments, uh, please reach out to Ted or myself on LinkedIn and follow our BOHS LinkedIn page for the latest news on the upcoming webinars. So thank you very much and I wish you all the best. Goodbye now. Adios. Catch you later. <laughs>